Please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship. When we turn from the world, turn inward, and even turn on ourselves. You, O God, invite us into your circle of acceptance. When we take small steps in the direction of forgiving ourselves and others, you strengthen us on our journey one day at a time. When we are finally ready to engage with others, you send us forth to prepare for the world of pain and loss. Please remain standing for our first hymn, Lord, who throughout these 40 days, the United Methodist Hymnal number 269. Join me on page 766 of the United Methodist Hymnal for the Psalter, Psalm 32. We'll read it responsively. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When I did not declare my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hands heavy upon me. My strength is dried up as the I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. Therefore, let those who are godly offer prayer to you. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You encompass me with deliverance. Do not be like an unruly horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with a bit and bridle. Those 
Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. God is still speaking. As we said in his welcome, as we begin the Lenten journey, we are mindful of the fact that this is a time in which each year we're invited to engage in self-reflection and self-examination. If we know one thing about Lent, it's that we're supposed to be looking inside of ourselves and trying to be honest with ourselves and with God over the course of these 40 days. For you, that might mean uh, adding a new spiritual practice to your life, or perhaps strengthening one in which you already engage. Maybe it'll mean starting to go to Zach's class that he's teaching on Sunday mornings as part of uh, your Lenten journey. Maybe it would mean that you'd take a day away on April 4th and be with me at Rolling Ridge in a one-day retreat that I'm leading there. Whatever it means for you, the invitation of this season is that we look inside and have an honest look at ourselves. Psalm 32, which is the lectionary reading for the day, is one of the most amazing testimonies in the Bible of what happens to us when we don't face the truth about ourselves and what might happen to us if we did. And so just for a few moments this morning, I want to reflect on this old psalm. The wisdom of the psalm is breathtakingly modern. You don't have to be living in the year 2017 to realize that a spiritual and psychological and emotional trauma is having physical consequences. When Jen read the psalm, it said, my body is wasting away. The disease, however, is because the person is not being honest with themselves or God about what's not going right in their lives. It says, I'm groaning all day long, and my body is wasting away. My life is wasting away. The cause of this cause of this physical consequence is a spiritual and emotional and psychological problem. The psalmist is not being honest with themselves or with God about what is not right in their lives. Frequently people in 12-step programs will, one of the mantras is, uh, we're only as sick as our secrets. And that's pretty sick for many of us. And for the psalmist, the psalmist is experiencing the sickness that comes when we hold secrets, finding out somehow that we can keep that from God or keep it from others or even keep it from ourselves. 
the Gospel of Thomas in saying number seven, he says, if you get out of yourself what's in you, you'll be fine. If you don't get out of yourself what's in you, it'll kill you. Another modern perspective of what it means to get rid of the stuff that's in us. And the psalmist here could not be clearer. There is something that the psalmist needs to say to God. And because the psalmist isn't saying it, it's making them sick and affecting the rest of their lives. Like almost every psalm, there is a linchpin between verse 5 and 6 where things change in this psalm. The first five verses are about what happens when you well, hide from God or hide parts of ourselves from God or try to at least. And then the verses that come after are what happens when the psalmist is able just to say to God, this is what's actually going on in my life. The linchpin is between five and six, but those first five are hard going and sound, it seems to me, familiar. What is not going right in our lives in this moment? And if you, everything's going well, there's no need to make up stuff. Fine, congratulations. But is there something not quite right? Something not quite right that we are either ignoring. We're good at ignoring things. We just keep so busy and a frenetic pace of life and just from one thing to the other that it's possible to ignore something that's in our core that is not right and will eventually, the psalmist says, lead to, to real sickness. Begin by ignoring these things. We, we move through a process, though, then of acknowledging that something's there, but then we simply deny its importance. We say, well, everybody has this. Everybody does that. Everybody's like that. That's how I'm wired. That's what it means to be human. We have a whole lot of things we say when there's just a little crack in the armor and we say, this isn't right, but actually it's what everybody has, so there's no need to be concerned about that. It's not a big deal. We move on from ignoring and denying to then hiding it, putting it back in the box. When the snakes get out, we just get them back in there and put the lid back on. And then we end up by having to be dishonest with ourselves and other people about what it is that's not quite right. It's hard to think of the venues in which one would be honest about such things, but the psalmist suggests that the first place to start is to be honest with ourselves and honest with God. If Lent is a season of self-reflection, I would have to say, and this is just my opinion, maybe your experience has been different, but self-reflection is not a quality that's in great supply in our culture. I don't see a lot of that on a daily basis. It's not easy. It's not simple. There's no app for it. And it hurts. I had a friend 30 years ago who worked in an organization that was comparable to one that I was directing at the time. And he was somebody I'd known over the years, and he was hired to be the executive director. And there were 25 staff in the group. And in an annual review in his first year, the way you were evaluated wasn't by a board of directors or a board of trustees. The staff voted on whether you had done a good job. And so 12 months in, they had the annual review, and 25 people said he hadn't been doing a good job. And he was fired. And I happened to be on his Christmas letter mailing list. And the way he framed that three months later was, God is calling me to something new. Yeah, maybe. But maybe also the vote was 25 to nothing. And even if it hurt, Maybe trying to figure out why that happened might have been in your long-term interest. Maybe God was calling you to something new, but God was the only one who hadn't voted against you of the people who knew you best in that setting. Self-reflection is not for the faint-hearted or 
It's not a simple thing. But Lent is an invitation for us to be reflective about ourselves and what may not be going right. Somewhere between verse 5 and verse 6, this wonderful thing happens, and the tone of the rest of the psalm is different. In this psalm, it's quite obvious. The psalmist confesses to God, and then God says, that's good. Sometimes it's not as clear in other psalms, and we wonder, how long was the gap between verse 5 and verse 6? Was that a day, a week, a month, 10 years? Sometimes it doesn't even say what it was, but a corner was turned, and it's a different tone. And so when that happens, in this process we're talking about, I think there are a couple of things that are part of that. One is that we learn how to become honest. And sometimes, again, in my experience, when someone has been carrying something for a long time and they're finally honest, it is a tremendous relief. And just as the secrets we have have physical consequences, I've seen people's whole posture change, the body language, the way they're sitting and talking to me. Sometimes if we finally are honest with somebody, it is a great relief. So becoming honest is one part of it. But that also involves something which is not as easy, which is becoming vulnerable. Because as soon as we're honest, then we're also vulnerable. We've let somebody else know that we're not summarized in our press releases. And if we were believing our own press releases, we were kidding ourselves. Being vulnerable, coming after this great relief, can sometimes be a scary thing. Because we're not sure what other people will make of us. The third thing we do when we finally turn a corner is, is that we do tell the truth to ourselves, to God, maybe to somebody else if we can find the right person. For the last three years, we've been in an experiment in this church with something called the 11 Step Cafe, which involves church members and also members of recovery groups who meet at the Watertown site. We've had 22 people now over the course of three years spend time together twice a month in season and out, breaking bread and praying and being honest with one another. In my experience, I've not seen as much honesty in any single room as I've seen in those twice monthly meetings of the 11th step. 11 members of the church, eight members of anonymous groups, and three individuals who are part of the church and part of an anonymous group. But the power of telling the truth in a setting where you can imagine doing it and not be judged is amazing. So after becoming honest and becoming vulnerable and telling the truth, then we also experience humility. Humility is different from humiliation. I think people think if they tell the truth about themselves, they'll be humiliated. That's not what this is. Humility means you've put your life in God's hands and in the hands of other people, and you've taken a chance. And here's the thing, they came through. Humility is the end of this journey. The psalmist is making it clear in this 32nd Psalm that the consequences for our lives of holding things in and not being honest can kill us. And the consequences of telling the truth, being vulnerable, being honest, and experiencing humility can give us a new life. Here's something I would say, based on my three years in seminary. If you have ever said anything hard to someone, said something that you weren't proud of, and they looked at you and said something more or less like, I'm really sorry about that, but I love you anyway. You know more about God than I learned in three years in seminary. If you've ever been honest and not been turned away and somebody listening said, I love you anyway. You know more about what God is about than you would if you went to seminary for three years. 
at least that's what my experience was like, 1972 to 1975. The psalmist wraps up this psalm by ending on a note that says, this is an invitation for all of us to do this. If Lent is really a journey, and we use that uh, phrase again, we use it all the time. Sometimes I think we use it too much, but I guess it's well-worn because it wears well. Um, if Lent is a journey, our progress won't be measured on the odometer. It won't be calculated on a Fitbit, which I didn't even know what it was, but my wife said I should bring that up and show that I wasn't <laughs> a complete idiot. I mean, not that that would prove that I wasn't an idiot, but I, I don't know what that is, but she said, put that in there, and it'll make you look like you're smarter than you are. And I'm always trying to do that. We're not going to be measured or calculated that way. If we make progress during the season of Lent, it'll be measured in our hearts, because Lent is an inside job. It's not something we make a copay about. It's not something we can get technology to measure. Lent and the progress we make or not is an inside job, an invitation once again. There's a guy who delivers food to our house sometimes <clears throat> when we're not absolutely on top of our schedules since we're a clergy couple. And whenever I say to him, so how are you? He goes, same old, same old. And you know, I think he's telling the truth. It is the same old, same old. I mean, how exciting can delivering Chinese food be to Watertown and Waltham, and then they draw the line at Belmont and Arlington. But he always says, same old, same old. And you can approach this as saying, well, another year, another Lent. Or we could approach it and say, my God, another year, another Lent another opportunity to be honest about what's not quite right with us. My prayer is that as we begin this journey, we'll find good company, no, better than that, good company is nice, that you'll find just the right company to walk with you in this season and in all the seasons that lie ahead. And for that I say, thanks be to God, amen. I would invite you now to sing the next hymn twice, number 394. <laughs>